Hello and welcome to the Tax Roundup for September. And it's a new month and a new Prime Minister, but things are still pushing ahead. Inside this month, we're going to take a look at new guidance from the ATO dealing with inherited property and creating a safe harbour for the main residence exemption. We're also going to take a look at a really interesting case, the Thomas case, that looked at the distribution of frank dividends and franking credits through a trust structure. But first up, the legislation passed by Parliament the day of the leadership spill, once again changing the company tax and franking rates and introducing a new passive income test. Across to Michael. Now we've finally had some progress on the company tax rate changes that we've all really been waiting to get through Parliament. And with all the things that have happened in Parliament over the last little while, one of the things we finally do have some clarity on is now how do we deal with the company tax rate rules for the 2018 year onwards? So for the 2018 year, we now have these changes which introduce a passive income test. So rather than looking at whether a company carries on a business or not, we are looking at aggregated turnover. And for the 2018 year, we have a $25 million threshold. For the 2019 year, that increases to $50 million. But the other key aspect is this passive income test that has been introduced. And basically what the rules say is that a company will not qualify for the lower corporate tax rate if more than 80% of its total assessable income for that year is classified as what they call base rate passive income. And it's various specific types of passive income. Um, so it's pretty important now to look at not just total turnover, not just look at whether a company carries on a business, but actually break down the type of income that the company is deriving during that relevant income year. What is going to make that more complex in many situations is that when income has been received from a company, sorry, from a partnership or a trust, we actually need to break down the components of those distributions because the nature of the income when it was derived by that trust or that partnership will flow through to the company that we're testing. Now, the, have, there have been some amendments made to the original version of the bill Interest income, which is generally classified as passive income for the purpose of these rules, um, there is a carve out. Certain companies will be able to treat interest income as non-passive or active income. And that includes things like financial institutions, other companies that hold certain licenses, um, where I guess they're lending money in the ordinary course of the business that they carried on. But you will need to look at that quite carefully just to test whether interest should be treated as passive or non-passive income. Now, in addition to the legislation passing through Parliament, the ATO has quite quickly released some draft guidance looking at these rules as well. Um, the ATO explains the meaning of a few different terms that are utilised in the legislation and provides a number of examples to show how the rules should actually be applied in practice. Now, one of the things that the ATO has pointed out is what do we do when it comes to dividends? So once again, the default position is that a dividend received by a company is dealt with as passive income for the purpose of this test. However, that's not the case if it's classified as a non-portfolio dividend. A dividend is a non-portfolio dividend broadly if we have a company paying a dividend to another company and the company receiving the dividend has a voting interest of at least 10% in the company paying the dividend. So if you have a holding company that has received a dividend from a subsidiary and the holding company holds 10% or more of the voting power of the subsidiary company, well, that dividend should not be treated as passive income. We don't have to trace through and look at what sort of profits were derived by the subsidiary company. We just treat it as active income when we're applying that 80% test. But if we have a trust in the middle of those two companies, that changes it. Where the subsidiary company is paying a dividend to a trust, that can't be classified as a non-portfolio dividend because it's not a company to company transaction. So it doesn't matter if the trust holds 100% of the shares in the company paying the dividend. Once it gets to the trust, it is a dividend that is classified as passive income. Even if it then flows through to another company, it will retain its status then as passive income. So the way the corporate group or the, the business group is structured can have quite a significant impact on whether things like dividends will be classified as passive or not and could have a pretty significant impact on corporate tax rates. The other thing that the ATO sets out a bit of guidance on in that draft 
LCR is how to deal with the tracing rules for trusts. Now there's a few gaps in that guidance at this stage. In, for example, what do you do when a trust has prior year losses? Do you have to try and figure out what the losses relate to? Um, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of guidance on that at the moment. But the HO does give some examples of how those tracing rules operate, how expenses should be allocated to income, and then how that all flows through to a company where we're testing the tax rate for that company. So there is already some guidance out there. If you're working through this for your clients, then it's well worth having a look through that draft ATO guide um, to try and get your head around exactly how these rules are meant to apply in practice. Now, it may be that you've already lodged some 2018 company tax returns. If so, they probably need to be revisited. You need to make sure that the tax rate that's been applied is actually correct. Given this very recent change, we just make sure that whatever position has been taken is actually the position that still holds under the current and new version of the rules. Dividends paid in the 2018 year potentially also affected. Might impact on distribution statements that have been issued, company franking account balances, the tax position of shareholders who've received those dividends. The franking rate may end up being different to what you thought it was. So for things that have already happened for companies for the 2018 year, they really do need to now be revisited in light of these changes passing through Parliament. We finally do have some certainty and some clarity on what rules actually apply. Now comes the hard part of actually doing it and actually applying it in practice. Join us for the Company Tax The New Era workshop to manage the myriad of changes impacting on companies and ensure that you and your team are operating at best practice. Places are already filling fast for the Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane workshops. And now from the ATO, the safe harbour for disposal of dwellings acquired from a deceased estate. Now the ATO quite recently has been working on a number of safe harbour options for taxpayers in a range of different situations. And we now have another one which relates quite specifically to sales of inherited dwellings. So we've got a draft PCG where the ATO sets out basically a safe harbour option and some guidance on how the ATO's discretion would be exercised when it comes to the time period under some special rules for inherited dwellings. Now basically the way the rules work is that if you're the trustee of a deceased estate or you've received an interest in a dwelling through a deceased estate as a beneficiary, there are some special main residence exemption provisions that can potentially apply when you then sell that dwelling. Now, Depending on your situation, in order to access a full exemption, you may need to sell that dwelling within two years of the date of death. And typically we're looking at settlement date in that case. That's not always the case. There are some other ways to get the exemption, but quite commonly we'll be looking at that two year period. Now the way the rules work is that the default position is a two year period, but the commissioner does have the power to extend that period beyond two years if he thinks circumstances warrant it. But it really requires at this stage you to ask the commissioner for that discretion to be exercised. So this draft PCG that's been issued does two things. First of all, it sets out some of the circumstances that the ATO would take into account in determining whether to exercise that discretion or not. The size of the capital gain doesn't really matter. What the ATO is really looking at is what are the circumstances that led to the delay? Were they outside the control of the trustee or the beneficiary? Or are they things that really were in their control, but maybe they were just waiting for the market to pick up to get a better sale price? So that's part of what the ATO covers. The other part, perhaps more interestingly, is a safe harbour. And what the safe harbour says is that if certain conditions are met, you don't actually have to ask the commissioner for permission to basically exercise that discretion and extend the time period as long as you don't need more than a 12 month extension on that two year time period. So what it means is potentially you can sell the property up to three years after the date of death without having to go to the ATO and ask for basically a formal exercise of that discretion. If the situation ends up being reviewed, the ATO will be really focusing on not so much whether they would have exercised the discretion, but whether you met the conditions to qualify for the safe harbour. So it will be important for people who are relying on the safe harbour to keep documents showing why they think they met the conditions. Now, one of the things that you will need to do to rely on that safe harbour is be able to show that there were some circumstances that were outside your control that led to the delay. For example, was the will challenged by a disgruntled non-beneficiary? Um, was it a really complex estate that required significant legal advice maybe to 
allow the administration to be completed. So there may be a number of things that have led to a delay. You've sold the property outside the initial two year period, but it's happened pretty quickly afterwards. Well, you may well qualify for the safe harbour. So important to have a look at what those conditions are, then document the basis for relying on that safe harbour guidance. But it certainly administratively makes your life a little bit easier. You don't have to worry about whether the ATO is going to exercise that discretion or not. You can basically apply it on a self-assessment basis, keep the records and hopefully access an exemption that might otherwise be a bit questionable. So again, another safe harbour option that's been provided by the ATO. We're seeing a lot of this in different areas at the moment. Um, and this is just another one that will help people in some quite specific circumstances access an exemption that might not otherwise be available. In Cases this month, we explore the High Court decision in the Thomas case dealing with the distribution of frank dividends and franking credits through a trust structure. Now we've seen this month a high court decision in the tax area, which is not something we come across all that often. And it's the decision in the Thomas case, which was all about the way that the tax rules apply to frank dividends and franking credits that are flowing through a trust structure. Now it's a bit of, a, it's a bit of an odd case in many ways. What had happened was the trustee of this discretionary trust, um, the trust had received some frank dividends during the year. The trustee had made this resolution towards the end of the year seeking to appoint the frank dividends to some beneficiaries, but the franking credits to different beneficiaries in a, in a separate way with different percentages. So what the trustee was trying to do was to separate the frank dividends and the franking credits that were attached to those dividends and hope that from a tax point of view that that would be effective. Now that was done for tax planning purposes. Wanted, the trustee wanted to make sure that beneficiaries were able to get the best value out of those dividends the taxed at the lowest possible rate, but with the benefit of the franking credits and franking offsets being utilised in the most efficient way as well. Now the ATO reviewed or audited these, these tax returns and basically was forming the view that you couldn't do that from a tax point of view. Now what happened then was that some of the beneficiaries and the trustee actually applied to the Supreme Court of Queensland for some directions saying basically that the Commissioner would have to go along with what the trustee had decided in these resolutions. And they were able to get those directions from the Supreme Court of Queensland. Well, the HR basically ignored them and applied the tax rules as, as they stand. And the way the tax rules work is in some ways fairly straightforward. If frank dividends flow through a trust, they end up in the hands of a, in the hands of a beneficiary, the franking credits automatically pass with those frank dividends. Um, the HO issued amended assessments the taxpayers basically appealed, went to the federal court. The federal court said, well, the commissioner did the right thing. Well, the taxpayers then appealed, went to the full federal court. The full federal court said, no, the ATO should have complied with the directions from the Supreme Court and can't really apply the tax rules differently or inconsistently with those Supreme Court directions, which would have led to the commissioner having to apply the tax rules in a way that wasn't consistent with the tax rules. Now this went to the High Court and the High Court basically prior to the hearing received I guess the acceptance from the taxpayers that they knew that this, this approach wasn't supported by the tax rules. But they're still arguing that the Commissioner should be bound by this Supreme Court order. The High Court basically decided that was rubbish and said well the Commissioner should be applying the tax rules the way the tax rules are written. So basically what the High Court has confirmed is what we probably knew anyway that when frank dividends pass through a trust and they get distributed on to beneficiaries, that the franking credits are attached to those frank dividends. If the trustee tries to separate the franking credits from the underlying dividends, that won't be effective for tax purposes. So yes, there might be a bit of paper where the trustee has tried to do that, but the High Court has said, from a tax point of view, it's not relevant. We're gonna look at where the frank dividends flow to, through in accordance with that resolution, the way the tax rules deal with that, who's assessed on those frank dividends, well, they will, that, those people will also receive the benefit of the franking credits attached to those dividends. So in some ways, it kind of brings things back to what we probably thought the position was anyway. It certainly clarifies, if anyone had any doubt, that the High Court thinks that franking credits can't be dealt with separately to the frank dividends from a tax point of view. Now, whether that's possible for other purposes, maybe, but from a tax point of view, those two things 
stay together and they can't be really separated for tax purposes. And that's the tax roundup for this month. Knowledge Shop offers your firm access to essential support to manage change and keep you operating at best practice. You can see what we do by taking a tour of the membership services. Just give the team a call on 1800 800 232 and find out how thousands of accountants make life and practice easier every day. See you next month.